Ever have one of those days that you're pretty sure it's a full moon and that everything goes wrong? Yeah, that's today. So if we can get through this without any hiccups, you know, things breaking, maybe losing internet connection, dogs barking, kids screaming, that kind of thing, it will be a damn miracle. So if you're here listening, I thank you because we're going to get through this together. Not only is this post-holiday, and I don't care when you're listening to this, you can be listening to this in June. Guess what? It's after Thanksgiving. Some people are still carb loaded, like they're still rolling around with their stomachs full going, oh, why did I eat so much? And even though it's like four or five days later, some of you are shopped out from Black Friday. I get it. So that's why you're maybe lounging today taking it all in, you're deciding to actually listen to some things that can change your life. So that's why I love doing these Q&As. I love, love, love doing Q&As. This is the thyroid and hormone Q&A. And we're going to dig into some studies today that I want you ladies to hold on to because many of you, and this is a very common question that I've been getting from my patients directly some of the questions that I'm pulling today, but specifically this one, I have been getting from my Facebook group, Dr. Amy, the Thyroid Fixer, Love Your Mirror group. That is where I am giving you all kinds of great information. It's our own little private niche down group. It's not like the Attuned Thyroid group where you're posting labs and you're getting that kind of information because I can only do that if we are working together one-on-one as a patient but it's a great group just to get inspiration and tips. I give you workout tips and nutrition tips and answer your questions and all that kind of good stuff. So this is a question I get in there. I have been getting in there a lot and it is regarding your cycle. So why is it so long? Why is it so heavy? Why is, are you skipping it? Why is it coming twice in the same month? So I want to dive into some possibilities on that as well as your thyroid questions. Okay, so let's start off. This one was really, really super good. And I don't know whether I actually answered this or not on my Facebook group. I have to go in and double check the comments. I answer so many. I forget whether I answered this one last week. But the question is, I know that if my thyroid hormones are out of whack, my other hormones are out of whack too. But is the reverse true? So if I balance my progesterone, estrogen, pregnenolone, testosterone, she's listening too. It's a good job on listening. Pregnenolone, you added that in. Will my thyroid function more optimally? If I add an adrenal support for high cortisol, can symptoms that I attribute to thyroid be cortisol? Ooh, that is a good question. So let's break that down. Okay, let's start with the thyroid as the master gland, right? That's at the top. And then as we trickle down, we have the sex hormones, just like she listed the estrogen, testosterone, pregnenolone. You got cortisol over here. That is controlled by the thyroid. You, with cortisol, you have pregnenolone and DHEA because if cortisol is low, we'll experience what's called a pregnenolone steal, meaning your body will steal pregnenolone and progesterone to make cortisol because we need cortisol to survive. So everything has a trickle down effect from the thyroid. Now, let's say your thyroid is a little bit out of whack, right? You're just kind of like a little bit wonky. You have all of the thyroid symptoms. Your T3 is like a three. You're just on the border. Your TSH is a two. Your reverse T3 is a 12, but you have all of the symptoms. You got the weight gain. You can't lose weight. You're tired all the time. Your hair is falling out like we talked about earlier. Hair is falling out, constipated brain fog, moodiness. So you can see how all of the the hypothyroid Hashimoto symptoms overlap with hormones being imbalanced and out of whack. And then the question is, we know that if we optimize your thyroid, that many times the hormones will come into alignment. Now you guys know my theory of both and. I am a strong believer in in treating both, in doing both and. Meaning, yes, we can be treating your thyroid and we can be optimizing your thyroid. But if your testosterone is in the tank, male or female, I'm going to want to address that specifically because it's going to take me a while 
to optimize your thyroid. That's going to be another question too. It's going to take me a while to optimize your thyroid, a couple of months. So at the same time, you're coming in with a testosterone of a three as a woman. You're coming in with a testosterone of 225 as a guy. We want to target that too. So that's where the both and comes in where I am balancing, optimizing your thyroid and targeting those low hormones down here at the same time. Because that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck is if we do both and. Now, then the question becomes, if you're just borderline, and let's say you, you, you don't want to go on thyroid medication, um, we are not using like a thyroid glandular or anything like that. Then if we start to target your testosterone, male or female, and we really start to kind of hit that hard and we're getting your progesterone levels and balancing estrogen and progesterone so you're not in an estrogen dominant state, can that improve thyroid function? The answer is maybe. So this is really where breaking down hypothyroidism versus Hashimoto's comes in as well. If you have Hashimoto's, so even if, you know, going back to all my examples, your free T3 is borderline, you're at a three, your TSH is at a two, you're just kind of teetering, but your thyroid antibodies come back positive and you definitely have Hashimoto's, we know that that is an autoimmune condition. So we know that your body is going out and it is attacking your thyroid gland and it is slowly destroying it with any autoimmune. And, and I get this question a lot too. So I'm kind of combining two or three questions into one answer. I get the question of, can I heal my Hashimoto's naturally? I did a separate podcast on that that we can link to and you can listen to. But the answer really is yes. And we have to support your immune system and we have to take down inflammation. So me balancing your hormones hoping that the destruction of your thyroid stops because you have Hashimoto's is not going to work. We have to address your vitamin D levels and make sure that's optimal. We have to make sure that we are to in, in total love and support of your immune system. Zinc levels have to be optimal. I don't want you anemic. I want you taking iodine. Yes, even if you have Hashimoto's, iodine is amazing for your immune system. Low iodine is tied to high reverse T3. I, low iodine is tied to an increased risk of cold and viruses. So yes, we definitely want iodine in the mix. We want to do all the things to support your immune system. And then in addition, reduce inflammation. So you've heard me say this a bajillion times. High insulin equals high inflammation. If you want to age quickly, jack your insulin up. Keep eating a standard American diet. Keep eating carbohydrates. Add a ton of sugar in. Don't cut out the sugar. Keep eating fruit every single day because you think it's good for you. When it really, I mean, it has antioxidants, yes, but it does spike your insulin and blood sugar. And keep that insulin high and your body will continue to be inflamed. So again, balancing all of your hormones is not going to take down inflammation per se. It's definitely going to improve the way your body functions and your body's going to thank you for that. And if you're low in progesterone, ladies, and we add micronized bioidentical progesterone, oral and cream, because those work best together, then yes, you're going to feel way better. You're going to sleep better. That will help decrease inflammation. You're going to have a better mood. You're going to be less agitated and edgy. And all of that will absolutely help. It will decrease your stress because we know that stress is very inflammatory. So while adding in the hormones will help kind of indirectly, we still want to address the things that are driving down your thyroid function directly, i.e. your immune system, i.e. Hashimoto's. Now, if you are one of the 5 to 10% that is literally just hypothyroid, meaning your thyroid function is decreased due to an external factor. And it's usually from a medication, it's going through radiation or chemotherapy. Post breast cancer patients are often diagnosed with hypothyroidism, non autoimmune, non Hashimoto hypothyroidism. 
excessive exercise, as we've talked about before, doing cardio, like your hamster on a wheel, doing CrossFit seven days a week, excessive dieting, caloric restriction, eating disorders, all of that can tank your thyroid function without it being Hashimoto's, without it being an actual autoimmune condition. So yes, you can have a low thyroid function, but that still comes back to inflammation. Your body is inflamed because you starved yourself and your body's literally in a starvation mode. So our bodies are smart. It shuts down thyroid function because it wants everything to slow down from that behavior. We have to reverse the behavior and not just address the tanked out hormones at the bottom. We have to address the behavior and support the thyroid and support the inflammatory response of the body in order to get that thyroid function back up and running if it is just hypothyroidism, non-autoimmune. If it's Hashimoto's, autoimmune, then we support the immune system, take down inflammation as well, and stop the destruction of the thyroid gland. Now, the second part of our question was about cortisol. Well, taking an adrenal support. So here's the thing. We have to know whether you're high or low. She may have said that in there. High cortisol, adrenal support for high cortisol. So adrenal supports for high cortisol include phosphatidylserine. That's really great for women. We don't want to just throw, I say this all the time, we don't want to just throw an adrenal supplement at you without knowing your cortisol pattern, without knowing whether you're running high or you're running low. When you say high cortisol, does that mean one point in the day? Or does that mean every single point on your four point salivary cortisol panel that you did? Because that's the only way to truly know your cortisol. You cannot just go by your morning cortisol number. That can be high because of the cortisol weakening response. So if you had a four point salivary saliva diurnal, cortisol panel that you're testing literally upon waking at noon at five and before bed. So we know your actual cortisol pattern, or you did the Dutch test. Then we can actually say, yes, you have high cortisol through the whole day or no, you're bottomed out with cortisol all day long. But if it's just one point during the day that maybe peaks a little bit high, you know, that 5 PM you're driving home. If you're actually working outside your home, you're driving home thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm going home. I got to, cook dinner still and Johnny needs help with his homework. So your, your stress response tends to go up at that point. So we can even tailor it to address those peaks of cortisol at that point of time where you peak. If you happen to peak right before bed, again, phosphatidylserine, kava, a good brand of kava, uh, magnesium, melatonin, progesterone, like we just talked about, helps with deep sleep. We can build you a stack that really decreases that stress response right before bed and lowers your cortisol before bed. High cortisol will affect thyroid function. We know high cortisol drives up reverse T3 and it hinders that conversion of T4 to T3. Remember, T4 is inactive, T3 is active. T4 has to convert to T3 in order for it to get to your cells and do its job. If, if reverse T3 is high, that means you have a conversion problem and it could be from high cortisol. It absolutely could be from stress. So if we address the cortisol the right way and not just throw an adrenal supplement at you because you, again, you heard it on Dr. Oz or you read it on Facebook that this one is great and this one will help my adrenals and this one helped my friend lose 10 pounds. You have to know your own pattern. Every single person is different. So I do not recommend willy nilly taking a court, an, an adrenal supplement. I do recommend doing the testing to know exactly what your cortisol pattern looks like and then working with someone who knows exactly what to do and when, but in general rule of thumb, ashwagandha is really good for low cortisol and it's really good for guys. You don't want to take too much ashwagandha. Like I would not recommend an ashwagandha supplement for someone that is, you know, let's just say they don't know their cortisol pattern, but they think that they are 
wigged out and stressed out and maxed out and they're overworking and they're staying up till 2 a.m. because they can't get to sleep. No, I would not recommend ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is more tailored for men and it is more tailored for low cortisol. Now you can do something like, you know, Organifi. They have the Organifi gold chocolate drink, which is amazing right before bed for relaxation. It has a sprinkling of ashwagandha in it, but it's not a direct ashwagandha supplement that you are taking that could bump up your cortisol. And we don't want that if you already have high cortisol. Really hope this is all making sense. I know it's a lot of information kind of tying together, but this is such a great question because it allows us to branch off. So you want to know your cortisol pattern. You do not want to just throw an adrenal supplement at it and cross your fingers and wish on a rainbow that your thyroid fixes itself. And then the, the overall umbrella answer it depends on how tanked out your thyroid function is. Listen, I am all about healing naturally. I have a lot of people, especially recently, it seems, really want to heal themselves naturally without going on a medication. And we can do that. And it will take a little bit of work. And it will lead into my next question about gluten. Because you're going to have to be gluten-free. But can we do it naturally? Yes. Unless... You are completely tanked out at the bottom of the barrel. When your T3 is 2.3, when your TSH is above a 2, when your antibodies are in the hundreds and you feel like shit and you're coming to me and you're saying, I can't lose weight no matter what, and you're crying and you've put on 20 pounds and it's not coming back off and you're counting the hairs that fall out of your head and you're tired all day long. And you're crying in your car because nobody's listening to you. And no doctor will do all the testing. So you had to order it yourself from Ulta. At that point in time, my dear, we're going to use thyroid hormone replacement therapy because I don't want you to suffer any longer. When you've crested 20 pounds, and believe me, I've been there. Remember my story? I stopped weighing after I put on 20 pounds. I'm still looking for those before pictures from, for you guys of me when my thyroid was all jacked up and I didn't know it and six doctors were misdiagnosing me. When you're at that point, I want to help you. And can you maybe get off your thyroid medication down the road? Maybe, maybe once we have your numbers up and your, your insulin down and your inflammation down and we're supporting your immune system, maybe. And then again, maybe you won't want to because you're going to have to pry the T3 out of my dead cold hands. I have zero desire to do my thyroid naturally. <laughs> I'm good. Like I, I am really solid good where I'm at and nobody is going to change that. But we are all different. You might, you might be totally different. You might be like, listen, I pride myself on never being on a medication. I want to continue that. So if I have to use, let's say, natural desiccated thyroid for a little bit because it's natural, quote unquote, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to do that until I feel better. But then I really want to work on getting off. Okay, we'll work on that. But I'm telling you, you might feel so good. You might be like, you know what? I changed my mind. Since this is natural desiccated medication, maybe I'll stay on it for a little bit. We can cross that bridge when we get to it, right? Next up, gluten. The gluten question. Woo! We get this a lot, right? So where do I want to start? I got this question personally from a patient looking to sign up. I saw this question in my Love Your Mirror Facebook group. Tried gluten, tried gluten for a couple of years, didn't notice the difference. And then the other question is, well, do I have to do gluten-free if I do your program? My answer is yes. And I am honest with people. I mean, listen, I don't want somebody that doesn't want to change, right? Woo, how'd I get there? Okay, let me come back. There we go. I don't want to work with somebody that doesn't want to change. Yes, you have to avoid gluten, but here's the why. And you have to understand the why and then it just all makes more sense. So I would say gluten-free is not a fad. So anyone that has tried it, I don't care if you tried it for six months, a year, two years, you could be, could have been doing it wrong. And by that, I mean, this is where gluten-free got a bad rep. Everybody used gluten-free products, quote unquote. So they replaced their cereal with gluten-free cereal and place their pretzels with gluten-free pretzels and their cookies with gluten-free cookies. And we got gluten-free pasta and gluten-free bread and gluten-free crackers. 
And if you look at all of those products and you look at the ingredients and look at the carbohydrate content, you will see that the carbohydrate content is still high. You will see potato starch and tapioca starch and sugar. Potato starch, did I say potato starch? Yeah, potato starch, brown rice flour, that's another good one. You will see all of those ingredients in the gluten-free products, and those are all still inflammatory. They're still going to kick up your blood sugar. They're still going to kick up insulin. They're still going to kick up inflammation. And then what do we know that gluten does? We know that it causes leaky gut. Okay, so bear with me. So we have the GI tract from your mouth to your bum. And there was a time that we thought that that was a totally enclosed system because it's supposed to be. So we thought it was tile and grout. These hard tiles with, you know, big, thick grout that is impenetrable. And then we learned over time that that grout is porous and it, it kind of acts more like a swinging door. So when we take in gluten, when we're exposed to pesticides and toxins, those come into our body and they pass through that door and they go into our bloodstream. We call these these things like gluten, we put them under an umbrella term. We can call them antigens. You may have heard LPS, lipopolysaccharides. They're molecules that get through the gut lining and into the bloodstream and literally wreak havoc in your body. They cause high inflammation. They cause a systemic, meaning full body, inflammatory response. So that's one part that we know about gluten, but then we also know that all that other garbage that's in the gluten-free products, like the brown rice flour and all the grains, the, the starches, the potato starch, the, the rice flour, the sugar, that will cause leaky gut. And that will cause your body to have a full body systemic inflammatory response. We know that, hands down. Here's the other thing we know about gluten. So we talked earlier about Hashimoto's. It is the destruction of your thyroid gland. And if you've been listening to me long enough, you will hear me say over and over again, the analogy of soldiers. Whenever we're talking autoimmune, I don't care if we're talking about Crohn's, celiac, Hashimoto's, psoriasis, lupus, MS, you got these soldiers in their barracks. And they are, this is the easiest way to understand this, folks. You got the soldiers in their barracks. And they are just confused. And they go out and they attack your thyroid or they attack your small intestine or they attack your gut or they attack your skin or they attack your brain and spinal cord. And the last thing we want to do is amp them up. The last thing we want to do is say, hey, guys, there's a war going on. It's time to get your, get all, all armed up, grab your guns, grab the Uzi, grab the tanks. We're going to war. No, we don't want that. We want them chill. We want them to stay in their barracks and play some cards and just stay there, watch some TV, but not go out and attack whatever they think is an invader. They're just, they're just confused. Remember, they're just confused. When we eat gluten and you have Hashimoto's, and I said this to the potential patient that was asking me point blank, will she have to avoid gluten? I said, yes, I'm not going to lie to you. I will never, ever lie to you. And I will never take on someone under a false presumption. I have said this for decades. I used to say that I'm not going to be like Oprah and say that you can eat a little bit of bread. Remember that? Remember when she did like a commercial from whatever weight loss thing she was doing at the time. I don't know. What the heck was it? I don't remember. Jenny Craig. I don't know. Neutra, blah, blah, blah. But she would, she came on TV and she says, I like bread and I can eat bread with this program. That is bullshitting you. If you eat bread, notice how she didn't say, I have Hashimoto's and I still eat. No. If you have an autoimmune condition, 
And she didn't say I can eat gluten-free bread either because that was like 10 years ago. If you have an autoimmune condition, you cannot eat gluten. If you have insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, you can't eat bread either. But let's focus on the gluten. We know that gluten has this, it's called molecular mimicry, where the body literally sees it as the thyroid. It has a similar structure to the thyroid gland. So your soldiers, when you, whenever you eat gluten, they go, hey, we got to go to war. There's another invader coming in. And they go out and they attack the gluten because they think it's the thyroid gland. And remember, these guys think your thyroid gland is bad. They're confused. They think your thyroid is basically an invader. They go out and they attack the thyroid gland. And then they attack your thyroid. So you just basically open the floodgates for your soldiers to go out and attack more. That's not a good idea. And that is why we avoid gluten. That is 100% why we avoid gluten. And that is why I will never bullshit you and tell you that you can eat all the gluten you want and you can eat bread. No, I'm not going to tell you that. I will not tell you what you want to hear necessarily. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And that is why we avoid gluten when we have an autoimmune condition, specifically Hashimoto's, because I don't want you gaining more weight. I don't want you struggling any further to lose. I don't want your hair falling out more. I don't want you more constipated. I don't want you to have less energy than you already have. So let's take some steps to actually make change. And that is why we avoid gluten. Okay. Let's get on the hormones. We touched hormones. We did. We touched on hormones in the beginning. We rocked those out with hormones and cortisol and the thyroid. Now we go a little bit further. And I'm going to get into women's cycles and this time that we are in right now. I have a dog with a limp paw. He's trying to get down. See, this is this is like the full moon day. This is what I'm talking about. And he's trying to walk down the stairs. I think it's working okay. <sighs> it's just this kind of a day. This is a Monday of all Mondays. And I don't care when you listen to this. Again, if you listen to this in July on a Friday, this is one hell of a Monday. Okay, circling back. Women's cycles, very common question I'm getting across the board in all different directions from patients. And when I, first, when I got the first question, I was like, well, you know, we're balancing your thyroid and your hormones are balancing out too. And, you know, that is that's going to naturally start affecting your cycle. So you might have one that's a little bit late or you might have one that comes early. You know, I mean, that's just how it is, right? And then I got another question like that. And then another one. And then I started to see studies. So here's the deal, ladies. We got 70-year-olds right now, postmenopausal, that are bleeding. So I did some digging. And I give credit where credit is due. Karen Martell, Other Side of Weight Loss. She just did a podcast on, on hormone, which is an awesome podcast. I highly recommend you listen to this one um, on, I forget the name of it, but it was just a couple podcasts back. I binged it. I texted her. I was like, I love this. And then I said, thank you for going over the studies because these are the very studies that I need to give to my people that are asking this question about their cycles. So we see this with the vaccine. We also see it with COVID. So if you had COVID, if you had the vaccine, this applies to you, which is pretty much, I don't know, at this point, 98% of the population, right? So you either had COVID or you got the vaccine. If you're in that tiny percent, then just wait it out. You'll get COVID. You'll be fine. And you'll have antibodies, but you'll be part of our 98%. I had it back in August. So I can speak from that point of view. Okay, we know that the CV vaccine is causing disruptions to the menstrual cycles. And there's not much research in this area yet, but there was a very, very interesting survey done. 
This was done by Kate Clancy. She's an associate professor professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois and Catherine Lee, a postdoctoral scholar in the Division of Public Health Sciences at Washington University School of Medicine. They launched a survey asking people to share their menstrual experiences with COVID-19 vaccines. So you see, they already started getting wind of how the V is affecting the endocrine system and is affecting women's cycles. So they decided to do put out a survey. Well, they got a humongous response. It's a 15-minute survey. It's no longer up, so don't try to look for it. I already looked. Ages 18 and up who had at least one dose of the CV, the C19V. I'm hesitant to say vaccine on here because I don't want this taken down, but all right, I'll just say it. The COVID-19 vaccine and currently have menstrual cycles or had them in the past. They launched the survey. They got 140,000 reports. They just wanted 500, but they got 140,000. So you can see women are quick to answer. And they got that within the within hours of the survey going live. So you can see that this is a very, very, very common issue with the vaccine. So if your period is all messed up, and we'll get into the different things it can do, this could be why. 140,000 reports, that's insane. So this is a quote from Kate Clancy. She said, this is one of the most motivated participant bases I've ever interacted with. Adding that she receives a lot of emails from people sharing their experience and their concerns. It's actually really beautiful. I'm doing two hours of emails every day and I'm still incredibly behind in responding. It's really normal for menstrual cycles to vary when your body is doing something like ramping up immunity to 90 something percent effectiveness against COVID. But that's a lot of work for your body. So if they, of course, things get a little unusual. And again, this is from Kate Clancy. Now, the problem is, is that the studies out looking at females alone and the COVID-19 vaccine is only about 6% of the literature. Male-only studies make up 40% of the total studies. So right there, you see that there's this huge gap in our research leaving women behind, but yet there's a huge outpouring of information with 140,000 women willing to give their opinion and answer a survey and say, hey, my cycle is messed up. And we do have, again, we have 70-year-olds menstruating. We have postmenopausal women spotting and bleeding. There was a recent study showed that COVID-19 infection itself influences menstruation. That's why I said at the beginning, this is for about 98% of us. This is for those who had the vaccine. This is for those who had COVID. Influences menstruation. Specifically, a research group in China analyzed data from 177 menstruating people diagnosed with COVID and found that a quarter of all participants had a change in menstrual pattern. In this study, researchers identified that nearly all participants returned to their normal menstrual pattern one to two months following having COVID. So if you had it, just wait it out a couple months, you'll balance back out. If we are optimizing your thyroid at the same time, maybe give it three to four months. Give it a little bit more time. This is where patients come in. So the endometrium, which is the lining of your uterus, is part of the immune system. Remember that. So whether you're taking the vaccine to amp up your immune system, if you're on the side that believes that the vaccine decreases your immune system, there are many studies out that shows that it does. If you look at the different markers, your immune system is actually tanking post-vaccine. Either way, it's going to affect the endometrium. So I don't care what side of the fence you fall on, it's going to affect the endometrium, which is the lining of your uterus because it's part of the immune system. This complex reproductive organ is a host to a multitude of immune cells and offers protection from infections. Those immune cells in your endometrium vary cyclically, 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 cyclically based on the phase of your menstrual cycle. So we're actually starting to see that when you get the vaccine in your cycle is also important and that will influence your post-vaccination response. So then when the immune response is mounted up post-vaccination, your endometrium reacts, it starts to adapt 
to the immune environment around it because it wants to protect the uterus. Now, I know some of you out there say, I don't have a uterus. Just don't listen up. And then this change, this crazy change in your immune environment triggers that abnormal menstrual cycle. So you can see an increase or a decrease in menstrual length, an increase or a decrease in blood volume. That's why I'm getting, my periods are heavier. They're shorter. They're longer. I'm getting two and three in a month. I'm not getting one for two months. I used to be regular before this. So it's going to be a combination, if you're working with me, it's going to be a combination of us absolutely balancing your hormones, optimizing your thyroid, and then whether or not you had COVID or the vaccine. Moving on, I'm getting down to this. Okay, here we go. So the presence of this receptor. So there's a there's an ACE2 receptor involved when you have the COVID-19 infection. And this is also part of the COVID-19 vaccine. And this ACE2 receptor is actually in the ovaries and it modulates the production of sex hormones, estradiol, progesterone, which then in turn can increase or decrease cells on the endometrium. So the timing that the vaccine is administered during one cycle, if you still have a regular cycle, can change your, your regularity of your cycle. So that's why we're seeing shorter, longer. So there was a research group in Spain that just looked at this. They found that that ACE2 receptor increases, the ACE2 receptors increase in the endometrium during the luteal phase, time between ovulation, sort of menstruation, suggests a higher risk for viral infection during this time, meaning that the menstrual side effects may be dependent on the cycle stage at the time of the vaccine administration. But we need more studies on this. And, and I feel like we are avoiding studying this because we, want, we don't want to freak women out. Everybody wants everybody to get the vaccine. We don't want women being like, listen, I've worked so hard at balancing my hormones. I don't want every, anything to F it up. Well, you know what? We have to just face what is going on and not hide our head in the sand and recognize that, yes, it could be that your cycles are messed up because you got the vaccine. And it could be that your cycles are messed up because you got it at a different time in your cycle. That ACE2 receptor, those are linked, the ACE2 receptors, plural, are linked to levels of estrogen. So it's not really surprising that menopausal status is related to COVID-19 outcomes with postmenopausal women having more severe outcomes compared to premenopause. This is if you actually get it. This is why the older population is rushing to get the vaccine. But I'm sure they're not rushing to get the vaccine because they knew that postmenopausal and postmenopausal women are more susceptible and have a more severe outcome. But it's still, I'm still going to say though, that if you take care of yourself, listen, I don't care if you're a postmenopausal woman and you are rocking it in the immune department, you're taking your D, you're taking your C, you're exercising, you're keeping your insulin low, you're not overweight, you're balancing your thyroid, you're taking your iodine. If you're doing all the things, then your immune system is fine and you don't have to panic and rush out and get the vaccine just because you're postmenopausal because you still could bleed. Like I said, 70 year olds bleeding, postmenopausal women bleeding. Women over 50 that receive hormone replacement, estrogen, hormone replacement therapy, i.e. estrogen replacement and progesterone replacement are at a reduced risk of mortality due to COVID-19. So if you're working with me, if we're balancing your thyroid, if we're balancing your hormones, mm -hmm. if we're amping up your immune system, if you're using vitamin D and you're using vitamin C and you're using zinc and we're keeping your insulin low and you're not insulin resistant, you're losing weight and you're taking care of yourself and you're eating well and you're exercising well, and chances are you're going to be just fine. But your cycle still might be a little bit messed up if you get COVID. Okay. What else we got? What else we got? Um, this is, again, I'm giving credit where credit is due. This is from Kara Martell. She stated, because I didn't look this up, I have heard that the vaccine does affect fertility. But as of right now, there's no hardcore evidence, but we also haven't really dove into it. 
that much in studies because, again, we don't want to scare people off. But we do know that the spike protein does go to the ovaries. It has an affinity to the ovaries. So this is the spike protein when you, whether you get COVID or you get the vaccine. They both have spike proteins in them. And we know that they have an affinity to the ovaries. So if you have it and it goes to your ovaries, that spike protein goes to your ovaries, it can affect fertility. Although there's no evidence that the vaccines affect fertility. But that said, we have to keep in mind the majority studies are done on men. And there's never been a time in our history where we used an MRN, MNRA vaccine on the masses. So, of course, there's no long-term studies. We can't compare this to the flu vaccine. We can't compare this to polio. We just can't. So we don't know how it's going to affect your hormones in the long term. But in the short term, ladies, I want you to know that your periods might be messed up. So don't freak out. I posted this in my patient group too. If you're having messed up cycles, that's totally normal, especially if you just got the vaccine or not even just 15 months. The vaccine releases spike proteins for 15 months. Even if you had COVID, we still have the potential for cytokine storm. We, meaning me, I had it in August. We have the potential for cytokine storm 15 months after having it. Now you build up antibodies. Again, you take care of yourself. I feel pretty solid and that I'm okay. My cycles have not been messed up whatsoever. But to anyone that comes to me with that hesitation, with that complaint of messed up cycles, that could be it. Last question I want to touch on is about how quickly I can see results when I'm optimizing my thyroid. So everybody is different. And I know, I mean, when you have been on the frustration bus for a while, it is really hard to be patient. It is really hard. And I actually specifically make videos for my patients to be patient because when we are starting off, and, and any of you, I don't care who you're working with, whenever you are starting out and your thyroid has gone undiagnosed, undertreated, mistreated, you're on the wrong med, you're on T4 only, nobody's paying attention to anything else or your hormones, and you are literally starting from ground zero. It might take a while to build up that metabolism, to build up the proper amount of thyroid hormone in your system, to get your thyroid or your testosterone level back up to normal, to get your estrogen and progesterone back up to normal, to get your adrenal glands functioning the way that they should, like we talked about in the beginning, the right cortisol pattern. This might take a while, and that's okay. But you have to have patience. So I always use, you might have heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating. I use the analogy that your metabolism is like a wet pile of leaves. Okay, you get this big wet pile of leaves. It's fall here in the, in the north. And you've got all these leaves falling down. They're everywhere. And you get these, now it's raining and it's snowing. you got these heavy, wet leaves. Well, I'm not going to go out and start a fire and burn the leaves. There's no way in hell they're going to burn. So I have to wait for a dry day and the leaves have to dry. And then, you know, when you dig down, it's all like muddy and mucky down below underneath the leaves. And they're all kind of wet and soggy. Even if you had like three days of sun, they're all wet and soggy. So you got to kind of, you know, move them out. You got to dry them off. And then you got to get, you know, your, 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 what is it? Like newspaper, or paper towels and light them on fire and get those underneath. You got to build up the leaves. You got to get them underneath. You got to get the kindling under there. And then you got to get maybe some, some pieces of wood and you got to get that. I know nothing about building a fire as you can see, but you got to build it up. So there's a lot that has to go into burning a wet pile of leaves. Your metabolism is like a wet pile of leaves. It's going to take a while for us to get things going and get it to that level where you're like, yeah, I have metabolism again. I can poop every day. I can think and I can make it past 2 PM without needing a nap. You got to have patience. Hormones usually take four or five months to balance out, sometimes six. Thyroid, you got to give it two, three months. Even as your numbers are climbing, you might not see a necessar necessary difference on the scale. You might feel different in how your clothes fit. You might see that glimmer of light that your energy is getting better, but you might not necessarily notice it on the scale. So you, you got to be, you just, ah, uh, 
You just have to be patient and give it time and don't lose hope, 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 hope. Don't lose hope because this will happen. If you're working with someone halfway decent, if you're working with me, I gotcha. If you're working with anybody else, make sure that they're schooled in the thyroid and hormones and that they're an expert in those. I don't care if they're functional or not. You've heard me rant about that many times, so I won't get on that soapbox today. But you got to give it time. Give it time. Now, some people's hormones, everybody's different. Some people will respond just like that. But in general, I'm giving you the in general experience. You got to give it a few months. Hormones are going to take four to five to balance out. Thyroid's going to take two to three. And that's not to say that in that first month, and I give people milestones. I give them markers of what to expect. Whether you're in my group program or my one-on-one program, I give you markers of what to expect. So yes, you can expect your clothes will fit a little bit differently at the end of month one. Maybe not on the scale, but you might just go, you know what? This shirt that I used to pull out, it's fitting better now. And I feel a little bit better in it. You might get on your skinny jeans to the point where they actually go over your thighs. Maybe they won't button just yet, but you got them on. So just those little changes might start to occur in month one. By the end of month two, by the end of month three, then you start to see the scale change a little bit. I just did a follow-up. It was a five-month follow-up with a patient today. She lost eight pounds, eight pounds in five months. That's not bad. When you are a hypothyroid Hashimoto patient, when you have effed up hormones, those little changes are the wins. Those are the wins. So if you tell me, well, I only lost two pounds this month, I'll go, what'd you lose last month before we started working together on optimizing your thyroid? Oh, yeah, that's right. I was gaining. Mm -hmm. So Alicia stopped gaining and now you're actually losing. And you're not a contestant on The Biggest Loser. Although all of those Biggest Loser contestants could easily be my patient because what they did to them tanked their thyroid function, but that's another day but you're not a contestant on The Biggest Loser. You're not going to lose 20 pounds in a week. That two pound weight loss in a month is a win for thyroid patients. That is a win that needs to be celebrated. And if you make one change, if you you stop eating gluten, that is a win as well. And you know what? I just have to read this. Miss Maria, you kicked ass. 13 pounds since your first appointment with me in March. That is a win, girl. And you're feeling great too. So thanks for the comment. That is a win. That is a marker. Every little thing, if you poop every day, that is, you're going in the right direction. If you think to yourself, wait a minute, it's five. I didn't get tired today. I didn't look at the couch and like long to be on it. I actually made it through my day. That is a win. If your mood has improved a little bit, that is a win. So thyroid patients, be patient. This is a marathon. It is not a sprint. There is no quick pill. There's no magic pill. There's no quick fix. This is a marathon. If done properly, you will have results for the long term. You will be optimized like myself and my patients and we're just cruising and we're living life and we're enjoying it. And we're like, yeah, I can have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Not gluten. I can have a gluten-free bun with my burger. I can have my sweet potato fries. I can have a glass of dry farm wines. And I'm okay. And I'm like gaining five pounds looking sideways at a gluten-free brownie. And that is where you can be, but you got to have, you got to have patience. Got to have patience. And this, Kimberly, I'll jump in and answer your question real quick before we go. Can you help with possible mold exposure, Epstein-Barr virus, candida on top of thyroid and hormone? Yes, it's all connected. Guys, when I talk about, obviously, I'm a thyroid fixer. I talk about th- fixing thyroid and hormones. But it encompasses everything. I mean, you hear me talk ad nauseum about insulin. But absolutely, I mean, candida oh girl, we see so much candida and that just goes hand in hand with insulin resistance. So if you're crazy, craving carbs and sugar, chances are you're going to have candida. 
if you get a lot of yeast infections, if you have a white mouth, a white tongue, candida. And we can test for that and we can treat that and it absolutely helps. Mold, Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus, that's in like 95% of us. I just did my Epstein-Barr. Girl, don't you dare feel defeated. I just did my EBV test and I went, oh, yeah, look at that. There it is. I have it. It's dormant. I do have one patient that keeps activating her Epstein-Barr. But most of the time in all of us, it's dormant. But Epstein-Barr is a precursor to Hashimoto's. So if you have EBV and you might have it and you don't know it. Maybe you had mono when you were a kid and it was just a really bad cold that your mom kept you home from school. I don't, I don't remember ever having mono, but there's EBV. So I had mono. Very, very common. Mold exposure. Yeah, we can detox from that too. If you know that you have it. And if you know that you're, um, what's the word, sensitive to it, and then it is triggering your body as a, to a histamine response or it's tanking your thyroid, that's another cause of non-Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, mold exposure. Epstein-Barr is always tied to, to Hashi, though. But do not feel defeated because absolutely we can make changes. Look at Maria. Although, Maria, I don't think you had mold, but probably had Epstein-Barr because most of my patients do. Either way, Cam, I hope that answers your question. Guys, I hope this was a wealth of knowledge. We did two lives today. That's amazing. So you'll be able to catch this on the podcast that releases Friday. Tomorrow's podcast will be about hair loss. Remember that right now I have 50% off both of my master classes. So the Complete Thyroid Fix Masterclass and the Keto for the Week. Cyber Monday, 50% off. It's good actually today and tomorrow. So if you use the code FIX50, F-I-X-5-0, you will get 50% off both of those. It's a huge savings. Huge, huge, huge. And it teaches you a ton. So you can go to my website and click on courses, or you can look. We've posted it multiple times in the Facebook group, on my Facebook page. You can go there. Post it on Instagram. You can go there. You can find the link. You can click on it. Use that code. You get 50% off. Okay. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me. As always, I will see you next Monday.